It's another thing you can thank the Persians for. Yeah. You're welcome. All those marathon runners. I don't see you people thanking Iran in any of your speeches. <laughs> Welcome to 500 Open Tabs. I'm Hannah Hillam. And I'm Kav Teharian. Welcome back to the show. Episode That was 21. a fun episode. That was With a Miles? fun episode last week. Yeah. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was a good time. It was fun to Miles see him. I hilarious. loved his song. It was really crazy that he did that. I was surprised. Yeah, it kind of blew my mind. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I'm hoping that uh, it doesn't become too popular and people will demand that we change our theme song to that. But... I mean, I was already um, kind of going to ask. Yeah, I was like, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we'll think down about the road. <laughs> yeah. Fine. Erase uh, my work, Hannah. Typical. <laughs> Erase my theme song contribution. Anyway, uh, so welcome <laughs> welcome to the 21st episode. I, when you're listening to this, this is mid-June. We yeah. are getting ready for San Diego Comic-Con, which will probably be the only thing we're going to be thinking about for the next few yeah. weeks as we ramp we up. Lots to do. Lots to do and still behind. <laughs> yes, always. Uh, still haven't sent off for anything. Uh, yeah. And it's getting closer. But, you know, got to live on the edge or I won't do anything. Yeah, we scramble together at the last minute and it mm-hmm. always works out somehow. Except yeah. for maybe this time. That's maybe always this what time keeps us going. <laughs> maybe this time I'm going to fail. Yeah. And they're going to come around like day two and be like, get out of here. We have someone different for your table. Yeah. Mm, there's a person here who really likes to draw dog portraits. So we think that this person should take your place. <laughs> uh, whoa. Alt- to alternate universe, Hannah. Yeah. A- Anna, who draws dog portraits. I'll fight her. Anna, I'll fight her to the death. <laughs> You'll fight everybody. Let's be real here. No, I won't. Once I get into like, <laughs> the, I, I'm like face to face with someone, I'll probably just be like, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Never mind. No. Anyway. Uh, anyway, we have some fun stuff for you today. I'm really excited about my tab that I've been texting you, but not texting you about being like, because <laughs> <laughs> we do try to keep it as uh, as as truthful as we can, in which like we really don't know until we start recording. But yeah. I- I'm excited to finally tell you about it. It's been, I'm bursting at the seams, but this week you're going to go first because yeah. uh, you're a winner. Oh, I won. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So my tab today is... Uh, mm-hmm. From smithsonianmag.com. So I'm not going to say the title because I'll do it in a minute. But okay. I'm going to tell you about the very first time the USA hosted the Olympic Games. Oh, and okay. So this would be 1904. And okay. all the bizarre, bizarre events that took place at these Olympic all right. Games. And now I didn't realize that this had been extensively covered on other podcasts until I typed it into Spotify. Uh, so Okay. Here's more of this, you know. <laughs> Was this like right before we started recording? Uh-huh. You're like, oops. <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah, I freaked out. <laughs> so here's some more of it. You got to feed Listen, the podcast machine. Our take will be funnier. It'll be less accurate. It'll be more <laughs> deranged, <laughs> less focused. You're right. Or as or as somebody said, surreal. Everything yeah. I create somehow gets described as surreal. So I'm just going to lean into that. Yeah, might as well. All the things that you go to for other podcasts and don't get, we also don't give you. We just give you something else that you we don't just, want. But... We just talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I'm going to try to recount this in an, a way that's new and fresh, but I'm probably not going to, but who cares? Thanks for listening I think anyway. Y- your take will be wonderful. I look forward okay. to it. Okay. First of all, here's where it begins. So the title of the article is, The 1904 Olympic Marathon May Have Been the Strangest Ever, written by Karen okay. Abbott. For Smithsonian Mag. So, first of all, it's 1904, and so far the Olympics have come back from like ancient history. You know, they used to do these games back in Greece, like thousands of years ago. Um, yeah. And this French dude named Pierre de Coubertin. To P- Pierre, Pierre de. I'm just gonna call him Pierre. It's but his Pierre. last name is de Coubertin. Pierre. So Pierre was this French dude who was like, you know what we need? We need to play a bunch of sports again. So he started it up in 1894, and the first one was in Greece, and the second one was in France, his his home. Uh, And the third one, the the USA won the bid. So this was crazy for us because at this time we weren't like a world power, you know. We were kind of like this kind of podunk (laughs) podunk (laughs) nation who (laughs) the Europeans kind of saw as yeah, like a little bit a little bit of podunk. Um, Like ah, that's cute. We're we're like yeah, we're better than you. 
Uh, yeah. But we won the bid. And originally, Chicago won it. USA! Like, USA! USA! So first of all, Chicago wanted to be the host. And they were like, yeah, okay. Uh, but then this French dude, Pierre, was like, no, 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 no. I don't want Chicago to be the host. I want St. Louis to be the host because it's also going to be the World's Fair in St. Louis at the same time. Beautiful. So, Love it. Let's just make it as complicated yeah. and as logistically <laughs> yeah. mu- a nightmare as possible. You've picked up on the first problem yeah. already. Yeah. So also because see, the Chicago World's Fair went famously great and like everything great. was made perfectly and nobody electric- died. Electrocuting the elephant. <laughs> Isn't that the one Mur- they did? Serial killers. The, murder, the murderers, yeah. The murderers. The w- missing women. Yeah, that wasn't good. Um, they're trying it again, and this time in Louisiana. Not Louisiana. Mm-hmm. I'm so sorry. Missouri. <laughs> Please forgive me. <laughs> Missouri, but it's called the Louisiana Purchase Celebration. So they're uh, celebrating oh, okay. 100 years of buying half of America for like a penny a mile or whatever it was. All right. Yeah, from the French, funnily enough. I, um, I feel like I should start doing that in my day-to-day life, which is like, hey, I'm going to go to Sarah and be like, remember that one time I got a super discount on this book and it was like 75% <laughs> off and then I had a gift certificate and then I put it on top of this, this, and this, and I only got it for $5. Today's the anniversary of that. <laughs> we're, Let's go we're out. <laughs> yeah, we're going to party hard. And I'm going to show everybody what a good discount finder I am. <laughs> That's some real shit. Good... <laughs> grifter i am um <laughs> so, so oh i didn't call us grifters no no so they decided to combine these two things we're like okay oh, yeah, we'll have the fair and the olympics in the same Great. spot perfect and day so okay they had games right at this fair okay. their own separate olympic ish kind of games which made no sense it was like why are we adding more games but these games were super racist and they were called anthropology days which is a nice way of saying a human zoo uh, and they, Dear Lord. oh, this this World's Fair is so problematic. deeply, deeply problematic. <laughs> like every single aspect of it is white supremacist, pretty much. It's like okay, yeah. So I'm not going to go into that, but Pierre was like, ew, and okay, pretty much. So he had the good sense like, to know that it was gross. <laughs> He he was grossed out by it. He said he he remarked. He's like, wait till they see how good these athletes are, and they'll leave all the white men in the dust. And you know, from a white dude in 1904. Respect. Don't go thinking Pierre's a good guy, though. He's oh, not. okay. <laughs> He's a giant, giant jerk. <laughs> you keep doing this to me. You're just like, oh, <laughs> you should root for this guy who's good. By the way, he was a horrible racist who like denied the Holocaust. And I'm like, wait, <laughs> you gave me very little information to go off of. I know. Well, you jumped on it, dude. You were like, yeah, <laughs> but you're right. I-, I did make you root for him. <laughs> but yeah, he was against the human zoo, but... He was kind of a jerk. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. So brave. (laughs) So brave. The bare minimum of being against the human zoo. So, (laughs) so, So like a few miles away, there's this human zoo at the fair going on while the Olympics is happening. Sorry. I'm not laughing. It's just horrific. (laughs) Ah, America, you know, he gave. So Pierre was like, hey, this is where we're doing it. We're doing it in St. Louis, but I'm not going to do any of it. I'm just going to stay over here in France. Oh, and perfect. I'm gonna yeah, great. <laughs> hire a bunch of I'm people. I'm not responsible for any of this, but you guys should. That's your problem. That's literally what he did. He was like, oh, uh, uh, uh-oh. <laughs> I gotta... uh, yeah. So Sounds like a studio executive. I hate him now. Oh, uh, 100%. <laughs> so he gave the job of organizing these Olympics to this dude named James Sullivan. And of course, I didn't okay. write anything else about him because I was too excited to get to the next part, which was Jimmy. Um, yeah, Jimmy Sullivan. We were so he was excited. He was like, "We're gonna make this the best Olympics yet, and we're gonna show the world that we're like uh, one of those nations that French people can respect." You know, like put on some games. How fu- and <laughs> can you French will like us? <laughs> Man, speaking of what of a different time, can you imagine anyone in America being like, "We're gonna make America something that the French can be proud of"? <laughs> Dear Lord. Yeah, no. At that point, they were still our like super allies from the Revolutionary War or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. Um, it's just such a strange yeah, conceit. Yeah, because nowadays it's like, I don't care what the French think. They're like, <laughs> not even do I not care. I'm going to actively go out of my way to make yeah. the French upset of our existence. <laughs> <laughs> That's like an American symbol of like nationalism. American, like USA. It's, yeah. Yeah. Racist against, against, the the, against the French. <laughs> <laughs> Racist against the French. Yep. Anyway, so he was excited to show the world that we had it, what it took. So they built this like 
beautiful Olympic Stadium, like top notch athletic centers and 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 places for the people to live. There's like a village mm-hmm. for them to live in. Anyway, it actually ended up like coming together really well. And people were like, dope, we're awesome. We're so good at this. Good and work, Jimmy. Thanks, Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy well, sounded like he was the one who had to do all the work. Do not root for Jimmy yet. <laughs> Got is there anyone I can root for in this story? Yes. And you're gonna meet him in a minute. And I just think you might find your new hero. So Okay, cool. All right. I thought of us when I read about this guy. Anyway. I love it. Is so, he also terrible at his job? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and Great. he forgets he forgets to eat, just like us. So finally someone relatable in these stories. <laughs> <laughs> just wait. So here's some things about the Nigeria Four Olympics. This was the okay. first time they ever introduced the gold, silver, bronze medal format. And oh. it was the first time they introduced boxing. And they had a tug of war competition. So like Bring that back. Right? I actually do think they have that still. Oh, okay. Um and the guy one guy, George Iser, won six gymnastics medals despite having a full wooden leg. So this dude was Whoa. like a machine. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So uh, so there's some little highlights that I'm not including in the rest of the story, but I wanted to talk about. Yeah. Um, wooden leg gymnastics. That sounds crazy. Right? Imagine that leg just flying off as you do like yeah. a... <laughs> then again, back then, the gymnastics were just like them rolling around or whatever. That's true. It probably <laughs> wasn't to the wheels. extent that it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Triple so... axle, double backflip over a you know horse and stuff. Yeah. A real horse. A I real horse. Yes. Real horses <laughs> this time. What, peg-legged man doing a backflip over a horse. Dude, I'd give him <laughs> so many medals. That guy wins. All right. So the main event is the marathon, mm-hmm. which okay. I know you probably know a little bit about the history of marathons, but they come from the legend of Pheidippides, who is this Greek messenger who supposedly saw right. a, Persian, a Persian ship heading toward Athens. And he was like, oh, shoot, I got to go tell them. <laughs> of course. Persians keep... <laughs> keep people. Keep it going. Yeah. Thanks, Greece. Thanks. <laughs> I, I'm going to move on right on. Um, <laughs> the, the Greeks had just beat the Persians in the Battle of Marathon. And this dude saw the Persians turning around and going toward Athens. And he was like, oh, no, I got to warn him. So he ran all the way there, warned them, and then died of exhaustion. But oh no, it's probably not true. <laughs> if anything... They said that it was like at least just a messenger who ran all the way to Athens to deliver the news of the battle, the winning of the battle. So yeah. whatever was true, the ma- marathon is 26 miles from Marathon to Athens, which is why marathons oh, nowadays okay. are 26 miles. I didn't miles. know that. Yeah. That's so they run the length of the messenger, dude, all because of you guys. So Because of in us. W- in a way. <laughs> yeah. So another thing you can thank the Persians for. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> All those marathon runners. I don't see you people thanking Iran in any of your speeches. <laughs> Get out there next time you win a marathon. It's true. Next time I run 26 miles. <laughs> Go thank Darius for what he yeah. did for this. Was it Darius or was it, it was Darius, right? I can't remember. Darius. Is that how you say it? That's yeah. way cooler anyway, than con- Darius. Continue. Yeah. Okay. So that's the marathon. So this is the main event and everyone is okay. like stoked because they've made this whole track for it and like made this giant arena so everyone fills this arena and Mm -hmm. um only only seven of the 12 nations (laughs) what now all i'm picturing is they open up the persians that are in the human zoo and then throw them into the (laughs) arena for like motivation for these people to start running away from them as fast as possible they're like no virgins are coming <laughs> they're just these two dudes like what they're like what, what are we you, why were we in a cage want me to do? <laughs> oh you know how we talked about like if this were us back at that end time what would we be doing sadly i think that's what <laughs> That's what they would put me in to do. Uh, yes, yeah. and I would just be—I don't know—a lady. You're, you're. I think you're a witch, is what we decided. Basically, you would, right. Every era, you're burned at the stake, is what we decided. <laughs> Even in 1904. <laughs> Even though witches had fallen out of fashion at that point, they'd be like, it's still, yeah, still, like, oh, no, mm, yeah, yeah. No, I'd be like in an asylum or something. There it is. Yeah, that's um, true. So, by the way, this only 12 nations showed up to these Olympics because no one could get there. There was this huge <laughs> war. They're like a destination Olympics. Are you shitting Seriously? me? Seriously, <laughs> Europeans were like, "Oh, I don't have money for this." <laughs> we'll 
Well, they blamed it on this, the Russo-Japanese War. So Russia and Japan mm-hmm. were fighting over Korea. Yeah, how and convenient. they were like... <laughs> That's not in America last I checked. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. They're like, oh, we can't get over there. Oh, it's really backed oh, up sorry. from all the war. Yeah. And I'm sure it was. I gotta go to work. <laughs> <laughs> Fighting Korea over Korea. Yeah. Um, so no one really came. Only eight European nations came. Um, and then Cuba and South Africa. Oh, no. And the USA. And there was one more, and I hate that I forgot it. Great. I'll get there. Persia. We'll figure it out. Iran. And Iran, <laughs> <laughs> which was called Iran at the time. Still so, Iran. No, I don't think. Yeah, it was no. Persia, I right? It's still Persia. I'm trying to remember the exact year where they switched it over. Yeah. But yeah. Those are the nations. And out of the 12 nations that came to the games, only seven mm-hmm. of them competed in the marathon. So a bunch of them were okay. Americans, and there were 32 athletes total at the starting yeah. line. A bunch of these guys were experienced runners. Like a few of them mm-hmm. had competed in the Boston Marathon, which I guess is old. I had no idea. Damn, I didn't and, realize it was that old. Yeah, and they had won. And at that point, it was like really like, ooh, he won the Boston Marathon. That's like the top thing. And so there were some really good runners there from the mm-hmm. American side. Uh, but there were also 10 Greeks there who had never run a marathon in their life. <laughs> <laughs> not a single. <laughs> not only that, two men from the South Africa exhibit decided to compete. And they were, so these two dudes were from a, a tribe in South Africa called the Tswana tribe. And they were over in the exhibit, like the, in the, the zoo? human. Yes. And they oh. were like, we're going to compete. So they show up, these two awesome dudes, and one of them Sorry, doesn't have... Real, real quick, are they volunteering to be in the zoo at that point? It was more like a freak, a freak show set up where it's like, look at these okay. people in their native clothes, and they get to do their native sports. It was like, look at these people of the world, but it ended yeah. up being really icky. Like, Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So these two guys from the South Africa exib- exhibit from the the Tswana tribe, um, right. Len, Len Taliani and Jan... I, don't, I think it's pronounced Jan because Jan Masciani. So these two okay. guys show up. And they're like, we're running too. And okay. <laughs> one of them has shoes. And uh, Len is like, I don't need shoes. Screw shoes. And everyone's right. like, all right, <laughs> whatever. And these two dudes had been uh, messenger runners in the Boer, Boer War, like in the last 10 years. So they were super, super like capable and extremely they, they good were runners. Literal marathon runners. Yes. Like from the actual origins of the word. Yes. They were they were message runners in a war. So they were like, Yeah, I don't need shoes. Screw you. Also, let's do this. Respect. Why not? And uh they can actually Can I like these guys or is this gonna turn yes. out to be a terrible Okay, good. No, I'm gonna root for them now. You can like Thank you. from now on, you can <laughs> you can semi to mostly love everybody. Good, 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 good. <laughs> Everyone's good from now on, except for the organizers. <laughs> I'll give you permission. <laughs> So these two dudes become the first black Africans, sorry, black, yeah, black South Africans or and yeah. black people to ever mm-hmm. compete in the Olympic Games. All right. Yeah. So USA, they had no idea. You, although they're from South Africa, but. <laughs> <laughs> so that they got that honor without even realizing it. They, were, they just wanted to go run. Let me go over it again. There's those okay. Boston Marathon runners. There's the right. 10 Greeks, the 10 Greeks who had never run a marathon in their life. There's these two South African dudes, one with no shoes. There was a Cuban postman <laughs> named Felix Carvajal who had raised the money to come to the U.S. to compete. And so, like, Cuba's like, we're not paying for you to go there. You're just some mailman. And he's like, but I can run real fast. And everyone donated money. And he ended up. <laughs> Good for him. Good for Listen. I yeah. love my mailman. His name is Ross. Oh, Shout too. out to Ross. I know him. He's a good guy. Mailmen are people awesome. To, they are I'm mail not, people. I'm not laughing at the mail, mail people persons. part of it. I'm laughing yeah. because he only made it to New Orleans before he gambled all his money away. Oh, no. So he, our boy Felix doesn't think ahead. He already loves he, him. <laughs> he doesn't think ahead. He doesn't really plan. He kind of lives moment to moment. So he gets to New Orleans. He's like, yeah, why not? I'll put it all on this game of craps. And he loses and he loses everything. And he's like, well, shoot, how are we going to get to <laughs> How am I going to get to St. Louis? And so he starts hopping boxcars on trains yes. and, yes. hitch- and hitchhiking all the way to St. Louis. He's just a cool, sweet, nice guy who people genuinely like. So he gets, yes. he gets to St. Louis and he is like, well, now I have nowhere to stay. 
So now what? And so he like goes and kind of walks around of the other athletes and he's like, hey, he makes friends with some of the like um, weightlifters and like okay. endears, endears himself to them. And they're like, yeah, you can stay with us. You can have yeah, our food. You're a good guy, Felix. Come on in. And he was like, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> so that's there's there's Felix and he shows up in street clothes, like normal shoes, normal clothes. And mm-hmm. everyone's like, you can't run in wool pants, dude. And so they like. Give him cutoffs. Oh no! <laughs> they cut his he's like pants. a never nude, basically. Yeah, he's running. He's Felix the Cuban never nude. Gets his. <laughs> his, his <laughs> I love everybody in this race so oh, much. I want them all to win. <laughs> you know they kind of do, <laughs> so, in their own way. So Felix is like wearing these tattered pants that he's been wearing for like however long it took him to get there. And he's cut them to make them into shorts. <laughs> and he's wearing just regular old shoes, like, that he's been in this whole time. There's Felix. <laughs> so he's standing there, ready. And this dude is, I'll send you pictures. He's hilarious. There's also this guy named Fred Lors. And he was, like, just a working dude. He was a bricklayer who liked to run miles at night. Like, he would just go just clear his head. outside. And, yeah, liked to run. and was pretty good at it. So... Fred, and then there was, yeah, all those other ones that were... He's from the States? Like, he's from the States, yeah. Okay. So 32 athletes begin to run. They fire the pistol around 3 o'clock, and they do mm-hmm. five laps inside the Olympic Stadium. Then continue onto a dirt road through the countryside surrounding the city mm-hmm. of St. Louis. So okay. an early lead was Fred Lors, the bricklayer, and he was doing good. He had kept good pace, followed by this guy named Thomas Hicks. He was another American guy, but he wasn't mm-hmm. like a professional runner. He was like a brass worker from Massachusetts. So there's these like working class dudes. Yeah. And almost immediately, problems began to show themselves. Oh, so no. Problem number one, it was the hottest part of the day in the hottest <laughs> month of the year. <laughs> so it was August at 3 p.m. The temperature oh. was at 90 degrees. Oh, humidity. Humidity was like... I mean, you know how humidity is. It's like you feel like yeah, you're breathing. Especially in the like south. Water. Ugh. Oh, Missouri humidity is crazy. Problem number two is that uh, one of those big Missouri storms that just passes through really quickly had washed the roads away. <laughs> had like washed out the roads. So they had to hurry and like redo the, the route. So it's <laughs> like, it like bumps and like cracks and <laughs> debris from the storm. Problem number three, a team of horses went first to like be the leaders of the race. And then <laughs> what man versus horse? What is yes. this? Basketball, baby. Oh, just kidding. I think of Nicola whenever I think of yeah. horses. So I mean, was leading the race because he was chasing those <laughs> horses because he was so excited. He is a time traveler. That's true. He is. He's from every era. These horses are start stomping, and the dust on the road is thick. And so oh. as they start to go that pushes dust into the air so the dust was going into the faces of all 32 runners <laughs> and they they were like because it was like coating their throats problem number four there was nowhere to get water <laughs> just there was no <laughs> there was i'm so glad you like this there was nowhere to get I'm water i'm loving this please don't Until, ever end keep going it, oh it's <laughs> I never I want this race you, to end. I can tell you it is not even close to ending. So at mile six, there's a little well. And at mile 12, there's some water. And that's okay. it. Okay. Um, reminding you, marathons are 26 miles. So yeah. They were inhaling this dust and coughing violently as they ran because they had no water. <laughs> so here's the crazy thing. Remember James Sullivan, the guy who took over from yeah, the French guy? Jimmy. Jimmy did this on purpose. He was what? like, he wanted to test the limits of human dehydration. Is he being like sponsored by like Gatorade or something? Is there some sort of like. <laughs> at the time, this was common. Big water Everyone... is behind all of this. <laughs> well, at the time, everyone's like, should we see what else we can figure out from this? From almost every event, there's some weird person being like, what if we did this? And James mm. was like, what if we didn't give them The water? CIA is part of this, too. <laughs> so this psychopath is like, don't give them any water. Do they know this? Do you know if you know, do you know this? Information? I, do they know I as looked, they're about to go on the race if they know that I they're not going to get any water? I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure it out if they had knew. Man. But I want to say they probably didn't. Uh, problem number five. 
The okay. course went over seven hills. So <laughs> there were seven different hills they had to run up. The last problem, well, no, not the last, but <laughs> the big, the next one is they didn't block off any traffic or roads. Oh, so they- <laughs> These runners were like dodging wagons and horses and people walking their dogs and automobiles, just driving alongside them as they were trying to like weave in and out. This sounds like it was hosted in LA the whole time, basically. That's what the LA Olympics are going to be here in like a couple of years, essentially. They're coming there. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's the setting. So all these people are running and mile nine is when people started dropping out because they were like, no way. I need and water. <laughs> the first person to drop out was our was our uh, blue collar worker, Fred Loris, the one who oh, was no. leading because yeah. he got a severe stomach cramp and had to stop. Oh, no. Like he was like doubled over, and he ended up like hitching a ride from one of the cars nearby mm-hmm. and being like, "Can you just drive me back to the stadium, please?" <laughs> and so Fred Loris gets on a car and just waves to everybody as he drives back to the stadium. <laughs> then comes John Lorden. He was one of the former Boston Marathon winners, and right. he ingested so much dust <laughs> that at mile Holy 10, shit. he violently vomited and would not stop, like couldn't stop. Whoa. So they were like, you're done. dirt coming out? Yes. <laughs> Just throwing up dirt? Yes. Whoa. My dream. Just yeah. <laughs> um, <Blah>. Then- <laughs> Which Can creates more smoke. Yeah. Oh, more exactly. dirt and more dust in the air, except they now it's like it- mixed with bile. Yeah, exactly. Ew. Oh, uh, they called it a vomit attack. <laughs> that's, so, that's what they referred to it at, as. A at vomit the time. attack. He had okay. a vomit attack. Then at mile 14, American mm-hmm. Sam Miller, another Boston Marathon winner, was in the lead at the time. Mm-hmm. But he got so disoriented from the dust that he was like, I don't know where I am. I have to be done. <laughs> so they pull him out. Okay. Then comes William Garcia. And William, he's from California. Oh, Bill. Uh, he almost died. So he uh-huh. um, he collapsed at, at around mile four, 16, unconscious, and was found bleeding from his mouth because he had breathed Ooh. in so much dust that his stomach had hemorrhaged. Jesus. <laughs> this is awful. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, my bad. God. He's okay. He, he's, I mean, he's okay. dead now, but like, sure, he was right. okay at the time. He he was treated within like with a nick in the nick of time. They were like, bro, if you had been on the ground any longer, you would have bled out. Wow. So he's out, and so slowly throughout this race, people are just dropping like flies, and they're starting to head back to the stadium. And everyone at the Mm -hmm. stadium is like, "Where is everybody? We've been sitting here for like an hour in the ninety degree heat in these these stadium seats. We're so bored. We're so hot. We're so impatient." And they keep seeing these guys come back like bleeding and like <laughs> disoriented. And everyone's just like losing it. While the the stadium is like, where is everybody? It shouldn't take this long. Let's uh-huh. go back to what's happening on the track. So Felix, the mailman, uh, he mm-hmm. was doing pretty good. He's a really good endurance runner. So he was, yeah. you know, keeping pace. And then because moment our guy moment. here, he does not think ahead, like I said, he yeah. realized he was so hungry because he hadn't <laughs> eaten in two days. <laughs> Just like you, every time we record say. the podcast, <laughs> halfway through, I'll see Kave's eyes go like blank, and I'm like, "Oh no!" And then I'm like, "Oh shit! It's three o'clock. I forgot to eat today." <laughs> <laughs> well, you and Felix. So Felix is like so hungry. <laughs> he's, he's, <laughs> he's like outrageously hungry, and so he's like searching for food on the route, and he sees these people watching the race, and they're eating peaches. And he's like, hey, can I have one of those peaches? And the guy's like, no, these are my peaches. What? And Felix, like, impishly, like, playfully goes and just, like, takes them out of the guy's Yoink. And runs away. He's so, like, what are you going to do, run in the marathon? Run it. He steals these peaches, eats them. And then he sees an apple orchard. And he's like, dope, there's some apples. <laughs> so he eats a bunch of apples. Which gives him a stomachache. He, he's a true, <laughs> true immigrant. I can tell you this. This is something that every single one in my, everybody in my family would have done the exact same. My dad really? would have just been like, a, oh, there's a bunch nope. of like pears over here or there's plums. So I'm me. just going to go. My grandmother, everybody in my family would have done exactly this. <laughs> I love this man. That's what he did. He ate a bunch of apples and then took a nap. <laughs> 
he laid down in the orchard, then he took a nap. <laughs> this guy just living a charmed life. Oh, I, I know. Everything just happens. It just ends up great for him. Some say he took a nap because he ate a bunch of rotten apples, but that was mm. a, that, that story is contested. I know he did take a nap and um, eat some pe- peaches. Yeah. So <laughs> Felix is napping. And <laughs> while Felix is napping, Len, the barefoot South African guy, yeah, yeah, yeah. is do- also doing great. And then out of the blue, a wild dog starts chasing him. More motivation. And he, <laughs> it chases him a mile out of the way. He could not Whoa. get this dog. <laughs> he could Sorry, not get I this just dog yelled really loud. <laughs> to leave him alone. And he was just like, what the heck? Barefoot, running from this wild, insane dog for Racist an entire dog. mile. Probably. I'm sure that that's what it was. I'm I'm I hadn't thought about that, but I think you're 100 percent right. I'm sure that's what it was. Yeah. Well, he he escaped the dog and got back on track, but he was then pushed back to like ninth place. That sucks. Um, I know. So Thomas Hicks, he's the brass worker from from uh, Massachusetts. Right. He's like, I don't feel, guys, I don't feel good. And he was like begging his team for water. He's like, just give me, please give, find me water. And they're like, we don't have any. We only have this like little bit of like warm water. We're just going to dab the inside of your mouth. <laughs> so they pat, like they sponge water into his mouth while he like begs for more. And he keeps going, which that sounds horrible. Sponge and water. At this point, yeah. We a bunch of people more drop out, and at this point, there's only 14 people left in the race. Okay, the race is almost over. Thomas Hicks, Sponge Mouth, uh, <laughs> is at the, at this point. He's seven miles from the finish line, and he is delirious. He's dehydrated. He's exhausted, and his team's like, "We got to give him a boost." And so, they give him a small dose of strychnine. What's uh, strychnine? Rat poison. And to boost him. <laughs> Apparently, small doses of rat poison can give you a boost. Like, like it's like a stimulant, and so they give him rat poison, strychnine. <laughs> if you're and, if you're listening to this podcast and you know why, please write us in and explain please. to us why rat poison gives you a boost. <laughs> Sorry, continue. So, this becomes the very first instance of doping in an Olympic game. Oh, it's rat poison! And so Thomas is like high on rat poison, and they give him some brandy to wash it down. <laughs> <laughs> they're like here here's some brandy <laughs> this is the most 1900 <laughs> like the year right? 1900 olympics i've ever heard this here's is incredible some brandy. <laughs> so he washes the the rat poison down with brandy and he's doped up and he's like barely lucid <laughs> but he's still running and thomas is like yeah i could do this i could do this and then around mile three three uh-huh. sorry three miles to the three end, miles out one of thomas's guys that gave him the strychnine look over and he sees a broken down car on the road and in that car is fred lors that guy who got cramps at the very beginning and hitched a right. ride and the people who picked him up their car broke down and fred has gotten out of the car and continued the race so fred oh, is cheater. refreshed yeah fred's refreshed and he just zips past and they're like what the heck and so they're pissed. Thomas is barely even there. So they're they're like, well, he, we got to go tell them that he cheated. But they're trying to help Thomas because he's, you know, doped up on rat poison still. And <laughs> and brandy. So during all this time, the crowd is still just like, ah, we need something yeah! to see. And finally, on the horizon, they see a guy. And they're like, yes, this marathon is over. Whoever that is, they're so excited. They're pumped. And in comes Fred Lores. And he runs across the finish line and everyone cheers. So they're like, yeah. And uh, Alice Roosevelt, the president's daughter, was there and she okay. goes and puts a crown on his head or whatever, like the the wreath and yeah. then goes to put the medal on. The medal, and yeah. Fred, Fred's just going with it. And then everyone's like, no, he's he's faking it. He's an imposter. Like everyone catches up. and They're like, he cheated. He drove a car for 11 miles of this race. And, Listen, uh, work smarter, not harder. That's all I'm going to say. Well, and Fred was like, well, I was. it was just a joke. I'm just kidding. I wasn't going to take the medal. Uh, I was just seeing how far I could go. Yeah. And everyone was like, you're banished from any Olympic game. Oh, no. So he gets disqualified. And Thomas, Strickenine man, he hears about this and it gives him a boost. And he's in second place and he's like, I'm going to do this. And so- 
What, what do we always say? <laughs> Rage. <laughs> Rage 100%. is the best motivator. I really think that was what it was because he was like, yes. And so he <laughs> he, sum- he summoned what little strength was left and he forced himself back into a jog. And after a little bit, it's like two more miles and he's like, yeah. he's flagging again. He's like, I don't think I can do this. Please don't make me do this. And his team's like, here's some more strychnine. More rat poison. <laughs> they give him more strychnine. They give him more strychnine and egg whites and have him wash it down with some more brandy. They also soaked him in water because he was like, oh, it, he had like, water at least. Like, yeah, wake yeah. him up. Yeah. So, like, woke him up a little bit and he was, it says, here's the quote Over the last two miles of the road, Hicks was running mechanically, like a well oiled piece of machinery. His eyes were dull, lusterless, and the ashen color of his face and skin had deepened. His arms appeared as weights, well tied down. He could scarcely lift his legs while his knees were almost stiff. So, <laughs> Poor guy. Jesus. One more mile to the finish line and Thomas okay. begins, to halluc- begins to hallucinate. <laughs> <laughs> so, he suddenly thinks that he's back at the beginning of the race and that he has 20 more miles and he's freaking out. He was like, I can't do it. There's no way I could do this. This is like you halfway through every episode after you yes. finished your tab. <laughs> so he's like, there's no way I can do this. And um, he, started, he started begging to lay down. He's like, I just want to sleep. Please let me just I just want to be buried in the ground. <laughs> I'm Thomas and you're Felix. Yeah, he's like, bury me in the bog. <laughs> Throw me in the bog. Throw me in the bog. They gave him some more brandy and egg whites, but be- no more strychnine because three doses is enough to That's kill too much. one. <laughs> it's enough to make him super sick. So by the time he neared the finish line, he was barely shuffling, completely delusional, completely hallucinating, hopped up on rat poison and brandy and eggs. And his two handlers were like, he almost didn't make it. They picked him up by the arms and carried mm-hmm. him over while he moved his legs like he was running. <laughs> oh, my God. He's like, like they cartoon. weakened at Bernie's him. Yes. <laughs> They weaken it, Bernie's him, and he thinks he's still running on the ground. So he collapsed immediately, finished his his marathon at three hours, 28 minutes, and 53 seconds, the slowest Olympic marathon on record. Doctors were on him, reviving him, and they were like, I, we're actually kind of worried about this dude. Not only is he, like, dehydrated, he's also <laughs> full of strychnine. Hopped up on rat poison. <laughs> yeah. He had lost eight pounds during the race. Whoa. Yeah. So that's the secret. Yes. <laughs> Just strychnine and running. Rat poison and brandy and then run 26 miles in three hours. I think we know what we're going to do after Comic-Con. That's a new Hollywood fad. (laughs) You don't need Uh, Ozempic. You just need to eat rat poison. You need to come to Do not eat rat poison, by the way, people. By the way, I don't think I should. We should have to say this, but you shouldn't eat rat poison. No, you do have to say this now online. Yeah. Like you will die. Yes, this is a sell, joke. <laughs> they don't sell strychnine in the stores anymore. It's like a highly yeah. controlled. Because anyway. of woke. Uh, because, sorry, continue. Uh, there it is. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Uh, he was revived. <laughs> he was revived and declared the winner and crowned by Alice Roosevelt, who was like, finally, an actual guy. Felix, the guy who took a nap, he came in fourth. <laughs> he made it to fourth place. The Len, the guy who was chased by dogs, came in ninth, but he probably would have placed in the top three had yeah. that dog not chased him because he was good. He's good. Yeah. After the race, everyone's like, we can't ever have this happen again. Let's just get rid of the marathon. And they almost completely <laughs> got rid of it. From <laughs> I like how the solution was, let's get rid of the marathon, yeah. not let's let people run 26 miles in a pout of dust with no water and then actively yeah. like make it harder for them at every turn. Yeah, no, we shouldn't right. do that. Uh, this picture of Thomas sitting in a car right after the race, he looks like a skeleton. <laughs> like, he's wearing a sash and he just has like this thousand yard stare. Uh, I'll post a picture. It's pretty funny. Looks dead inside. Anyway, so after that, yeah, everyone was like, those Olympics were insane. And that kind of overshadowed the rest of the games because the rest of the games went pretty good. Like there was some really cool stuff happening. And Pierre was like, yeah, that was all St. Louis's fault. Then like wrote a big book about how they botched it when really it was totally him and yeah so that's like that's the 1904 marathon from the winter from the summer olympics and then nuts wow. that oh yes continue felix ended up disappearing <laughs> <laughs> disappearing overseas uh declared dead and then he showed up again 
Of course he did. Uh, yeah, being like, I was I bet you guess. he's still alive somewhere right now. Just <laughs> He's, he's uh, immortal. But yeah, so uh, there you go. I never know how to end these. Oh my God. Yeah, I got a... Wow. That was... That might be my favorite one that you've done so far in the show. That was really? great. Yes. That yeah, was... That's crazy. That was fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> oh my uh, God. That was so ridiculous. Is that insane? Oh. Just like it's just like a comedy of errors, like vomit attacks, some dude taking strychnine and like chugging brandy, someone stealing peaches. I'm gonna <laughs> go out on a limb and say that <laughs> even if other people have covered this, I feel like yours was probably funnier than the rest of them. I'm oh saying gosh. that with a sample of zero. <laughs> Thank but you. in my heart, I know <laughs> that yours was. No one would have told it the way that you did. That was that was <laughs> really fun. Really- really nice of you i really enjoyed that that was really funny i got super into this one Uh, i can tell i I almost did like a one just on felix and then Mm -hmm. to lead up to 1904 but then i was like there isn't that much about felix that can make an episode but yeah Felix. i think felix uh, Felix will be a person that we'll come back to i think we're gonna he's gonna be part of our lore now of people that we love yeah felix what's his last name again I couldn't Sorry. remember it, so I just kept calling him Felix the Cuban Mailman throughout all of this, which was way longer Listen, than Felix I Felix the Cuban Mailman, that's all we need to know. Carvajal. Carvajal. Felix Carvajal, we salute you. In your adve- Can you imagine the adventures that that man was on? And like he... I want no. to read like an autobiography of him, like like all the random stories that he's experienced in his life. Because this just this one alone was like, yeah. And then I was a mailman, and then the government right. wouldn't send pay for me to go to the Olympics, right. so I raised all this money and then lost it all in the gamble. And in then New I had Orleans. to like, yeah, New Orleans. So I had to jump on a bunch of boxcars, and then I slept with on the floor of these weightlifters, and then I <laughs> ran this marathon where everyone's vomiting, and then I got hungry, so I stole a peach and then <laughs> passed out under an apple tree, and then I came in fourth somehow, like. <laughs> While wearing regular shoes. <laughs> you were regular um, shorts and, and cutoffs. So here's what I was gonna say. He actually went, he was selected to represent Cuba in the next Olympics. Oh. And he went, and the, it was at, it was at, um in Athens. And nice. so. They paid for it, but he never arrived in Athens. <laughs> so everyone's like, he's dead. And his obituary was published in Cuban newspapers. And then he later showed up in Havana. He's just like, and, oh, yeah, I missed the boat like six years ago. I just yeah. went back to being a mailman and no one seemed to notice. Yeah. I wonder if he just like got a job on the boat. I'm sure <laughs> like, he just did some 100%. other adventure. Amazing. Anyway, he died in poverty. That's sad. Oh, I wish I hadn't have said that. Great. I mean, technically, he was in poverty this whole story, whole really. Time. <laughs> you wouldn't die in poverty if, if you were Felix. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, your turn. What tab? Show me your tab. Okay, I will show you my tab. Uh, that was awesome. Thank you again. Uh, mine is Thanks. also a little bit of an old-timey one. And uh, this, is a f- this is a fun one, and I think you're really going to like it. And um, it was a lot of random stuff to sift through, but it's it's a fun story. So... Uh, my original tab is from the uh, Library of Congress blog. Oh, they have a blog? I didn't know that until I found this. Wow. And the title of it is Belief, Legend, and the Great Moon Hoax. Wow. Have you heard of like this? The moon landing hoax? No. Oh, this is... no. Oh, Wait, no, 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 no. Like the moon's okay, good. not real? No, no, this is, you're going to love this. I'm fixing it on the moon. Okay. This is the little blurb. So it says, during the week of August 25th, 1835, the world was treated to a fantastic story of scientific discoveries by the famous British astronomer, Sir John Herschel. He had realized the speculations of his father, astronomer Sir William Herschel, as he discovered life on the moon, or so the readers of the New York Sun were told in a series of articles now known as the Great Moon Hoax. Oh, this is cool. Okay. Yep. This kind of reminds me of that, uh, that the War of the Worlds. Yes, broadcast. that's actually a, a big reference point for this, where people were like, <laughs> it's kind of like the same idea, but it happened like 100 years earlier. Oh my gosh. Okay. So Love this kind of stuff. I've never heard of this. This is exciting. I had never heard of this either. I was, I was really excited. There's a lot of... Uh, there's, there's so much stuff that happens around it, which is really interesting. It's like a, it's, it's like a first event in so many different ways. So I'll, and I'll explain all of it. I'll give all the context. I'll get into what the 
you know, stories are and all that. And it's we're going to have fun with it. So okay. back in 1835, things were a little different, as you might imagine. But just to set the stage, here's some fun facts of stuff that happened that year. So first off, our boy Samuel Longhorn Clemens, a.k.a. Mark Twain, is born. Oh, whoa. That's how long ago this is. Yeah. I had as, <laughs> yeah. Uh, as is Andrew Carnegie. Oh, so it's a time of great pioneers. And speaking uh-huh. of pioneers, a man named yeah. Richard Lawrence pioneers the failed presidential assassination industry by trying to kill President Andrew Jackson and failing. <laughs> oh, he failed. He failed. I mean, oh, he, fa- he failed. He failed. <laughs> this was the uh, the very first assassination attempt against a president of these United States. So wow. Richard Lawrence. First failed too. pioneer. Yeah. And the Toledo That's an War American between tradition. <laughs> that is an American tradition. Uh, and then the Toledo War between the state of Ohio and the Michigan Territory erupts over the city of Toledo and the Toledo Strip. Which, if you know Whoa. anybody from Michigan, a lot of them are very anti anti Ohio. So I guess this is sort of where it starts. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. Is Sarah? Uh, is Sarah anti Ohio? No, Sarah's Sarah's pretty friendly. But I do know plenty of Sarah's friends who are from Michigan who are very like Ohio. I don't mess with Ohio people. Uh, it's a whole thing. I don't understand it, but I think it might be, I guess, this war that goes back here. to 1835. Yeah. So speaking of our boy, Marky Mark, do you remember the event that famously connects his birth and death? Mark no. Twain. Oh, uh, I was like, Marky Mark? Marky Mark why, and the why Funky did Bunch. just like zoom forward? I'm confused. He was break dancing back in 1835. Oh, yeah. It was great. Uh, no, but do you remember the event that connects the yeah. birth and death? Uh, of... Isn't it the comet? Exactly right. Yeah. So in 1835, Haley my, was making this her. My hun- this is my century. I love this. I love the 1800s. Um, so, you know, she's doing her trip of every 75 years to visit planet Earth and to wave yeah. hello at us mere mortals. And she continues to explore the depths of space. Um, Good for her. Since I know your ass is probably going to stop paying attention right now and look this up. Oh my I gosh. just, I will tell you right now. I'm the not. Last, <laughs> Haley's Comet was in 1986 and will return in 2061. Wondering. Yeah. I was wondering. <laughs> I was like, I should look that up later. Yeah, 2061 is when it's coming back. I don't know. I'll probably be dead. Buried in the bog. So at this time, people were very excited because Haley's Comet was going to come back. I mean, they weren't rushing out to like buy Nike Nike decades or like hitch a ride on it or anything, but they were like hooked on all the space stuff and it was a big deal. So according to a lot of historians at that time, astronomers were having a sort of capital M moment. If you were an astronomer, it was a big deal. Because in some ways, as the analog that they make is like, it's kind of like how priests were at the time or not at that time, but previously. So yeah. a priest, you know, before would have been like, well, I can read and there's this book that has access to all this information. And I'm right. just going to tell you what is in this book. So a lot of astronomers who knew how to- they wanted. Literally, yeah. So a yeah. lot of uh, astronomers were like, okay, cool. We got these like telescopes and like star readings and all this stuff. And and like religion in the mainstream was sort of having this revival. Oh, I, yeah, I know that. Yeah. So they were kind of like, it was like known as the burnt over er- era or whatever, where all of New York was like freaking out about religion. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, Every, the, and that's these... where a ton of religions, I mean, came from. Everyone at the time was like, really into weird like folk magic but also being really into science at the same time exactly yes that's 100 oh. percent correct and all these astronomers it was not even though they were astronomers and they were you know supposed men of science they were like also very religious and so to a lot of them it was like that goes hand in hand why would god yeah. have made all these far away heavenly bodies and not have like you know a bunch of crazy animals and people living on them that worship god and we're like hey god awesome great job with saturn like those rings 10 out of 10 would bang we love you i mean if i had the choice yeah her, she would be the one yeah saturn. <laughs> yeah out of all of them absolutely so one of these astronomers was this dude named thomas dick <laughs> i'm letting you laugh yes exactly <laughs> so mm. old tom dick he was like the neil degrasse tyson of his day oh he made <laughs> Sorry. So he was a smug. He was smug on Twitter. He was smug on Twitter. He was very popular. A lot of people followed him and knew him. And he would make all these kind of weird ass claims, uh, most notably to this story, that the moon had something like four billion creatures living on it. Oh, and people were like, wow, he's wearing a nebula tie. So he must be telling the truth. 
guy has a telescope. He must know exactly what's on the moon. He can't. Why would he lie? He's only telling the truth. Yeah. So at this time, the New York Sun had been founded just two years earlier in 1833. And they printed it on steam powered printing presses, which was brand spanking new technology that just yes, come it out. Was. And uh, as such, it was known as a penny press paper that appealed to a wider audience with a cheaper price and a more narrative style of journalism. And it was doing very well. Whereas so before, those, those kind of those kind of newspapers have always been around, like just like the kind of cheaper, maybe more like, you know, not accurate or what? Uh, I think at this point, it, it, I imagine it's something similar to what's happening now. Okay. Um, which is part of why I thought this story was interesting is that like you have to the the rate at which things were becoming published and to the yeah. degree of which they were being distributed all of a sudden got so big that oh, they were right. just like, oh, I don't know, whatever. Like, we'll just put all this stuff in there. <laughs> just go. There's no time for fact checking. It's fine. Whatever. <laughs> got it. <laughs> and uh, and also, you know, there's not people. People don't realize that like how much of journalism has changed since then in terms of like standards. Right. And. Uh, fact checking <laughs> and you can't like just make stuff up. I mean, apparently yeah. you still can because, you know, a tech company will throw billions of dollars behind it to make sure it reaches the farthest possible audience in order to radicalize you so they can sell ads. However, <laughs> that's a story for a different day. Podcasting at the end of the world. Yeah. <laughs> that's what it feels like sometimes. Very much so. So um, the owner of the sun is this guy named Benjamin Day. And Benjamin Day is like this, he's like, you know, bada bing, bada boom. If it bleeds, it leads. I got pages to fill. I got to find one of these like nerds who are writing long ass Tumblr posts, <laughs> you know, give him a job and put him in my paper. I got shit to sell. And Listicles. so he hires this guy. His name is Richard Adams Locke. Locke, Dick and Day? Locke, Dick, Day. <laughs> <laughs> Great. It's a holiday. Yeah. yeah uh, Locke, Locke, Dick, Dick Day. It's Dick Locking Adams up, Lock. <laughs> I want to go so much further with that joke, but I will I get know. derailed. Um, Good job. Locke is this educated guy and he's fresh from England. And he's like, you know, he's he's like a skeleton from Nacho Libre. Have you seen Nacho Libre? Oh, uh, duh. Sorry. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good. He's just like, <laughs> why are you always trying to baptize me? I believe in science. <laughs> I believe in science. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that character. I love that, that movie so good. Me too. He's all, I hate the orphans. Uh, so he <laughs> he only believes in science. He's like, I hate religion. Religion's whack. I'm not buying this crap from that dick, Thomas Dick. This is just religion 2.0. You guys are out of your minds. Oh, like he's super yeah, yeah. anti. He's not into it. Um, so that's the context of that guy as a writer. So now this is an important part. So in June of that same year in 1835, mm -hmm. Edgar Allan Poe, famously, you know, the guy who wrote oh yeah, a lot of stuff, Telltale oh, yeah. Heart, The Raven, all that stuff. He had written a story in the Southern Literary Messenger titled Hands Fall a Tale. And it okay. described the return of an explorer to his native Holland with stories of life and adventures on the moon. It was meant to be a satire, cool. <laughs> but oh. Poe's sense of humor was apparently too noticeable, and it was quickly recognized as fiction by many of his readers. Uh, yeah, he wasn't one. He wasn't known to be like uh, complex, <laughs> <laughs> right? In my in, like, I don't know. I feel like he's pretty heavy-handed, but in a good way. Right, right. He wasn't like he wasn't cheeky enough, essentially, no. for it. And so people were just like, "Oh, bro, what are you doing? Like, this it's isn't Edgar. you." Yeah, they're like Edgar. You just too, this is too goth. Like, you obviously yeah. it's yours. It's, it's not like a real serious. article written by yourself. Yeah. So uh, the Southern Literary Messenger was a periodical of fact and fiction that had only been around for about ten months at the time. So oh, well. it didn't really have wide circulation. It was just starting up. He couldn't go viral, and <laughs> people didn't really know about it that much. Now, there's no proof, but it's speculated that Locke, remember the writer, he was yeah. inspired by Poe's story and took that as a template and was like, oh, I'll do you one better. And he goes into full on, like a full on bullshitting terror driven purely out of spite. And <laughs> Spite again? It's spite again. Oh, it does and so much. It does spite. Yeah, it's perfect. It's the motivator of our podcast and everything. Yeah. And so he starts pulling all this crap 
that random astronomer, astro astronomers had claimed to discover or calculate. And he's just sitting behind his typewriter and he's like, oh, yeah, OK, cool. People on the moon, <laughs> this, whatever, <laughs> idiots, stars, God, whatever, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> And he just like goes at it, right? He's just, he's staying up all night. He's motivated. He's just driven. And he comes out and he writes this thing and he bangs out what's simply titled Great Astronomical Discoveries Lately Made by John Herschel. That's a long title. All made up. <laughs> once I, once like you got to the word lately, I was like, oh no. Lately. More. Yeah. <laughs> lately. I'm, all, I'm over it. <laughs> like just, just men in the moon. Keep it at that. Men on the moon would have been fun. Locke writes his story as a serialized set of articles released over the course of six days. And he doesn't just, you know, so he doesn't just drop the whole season at once because he knew that wouldn't build community. So he's like, you got to no, drip, drip slowly. He, he's, you know, <laughs> the old school wanna... network model, not yeah. the Netflix model is what he does. You got to have people talk about it. You got to have people like get all excited. The Moon Man story. You can't binge it. No, you got to make sure that there's enough time for it to grow and bloom like a flower. Yes. You can't really get invested that way. So the articles were written as if reported by astronomer Dr. Andrew Grant, who <laughs> Locke Is he just real? made up. No, nope, yeah, no, he's not real. <laughs> made this up. It's just made up. Do anything. You could say anything. It, oh. it, this is hilarious how, how insane this gets. So Locke was somebody he made up and Dr. Grant was described as a colleague of someone who actually existed, who was Sir John Herschel, a famous yeah. astronomer of the day, which it looks like you knew that name, huh? Yeah, I know. I know who this guy is. Yeah. So Herschel was real. And he had, in fact, traveled to Cape Town, South Africa in January oh. of 1834 to set up an observatory with a powerful new telescope. So that cool. was real. That actually happened. But of yeah. course, he, he was in England. So it's like he went from England to Cape Town. And this is 1834. Like you said earlier. Like in 1904, people weren't like, you know, getting information across the ocean like very no. quickly. So at this point, this is even worse. So, oh, yeah. People, people knew know him. you died for like weeks and weeks and weeks. Like Exactly. Yeah. 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 But at that point, they had known that this is something that he did. So, again, Locke is like, great. I'm going to lie. So I'm going to make up this story about. <laughs> <laughs> I'll use one real name and I'll make up the rest. Yeah. That's smart. So. So Dr. Grant is, he basically catfishes everybody. So Dr. Grant is this made up person. I would love to see a, a, a catfish show with everybody dressed up like they're in the 1830s. This could be the basis for it. Yeah. So Dr. Grant in this story is basically like, yeah, bro, I, it was like sick. I totally went with him and I set up the telescope and we saw these like crazy things and it was like awesome. And that's basically the narrative of the story that he ends up writing over the course of six days. Wait, so <laughs> I love it. I love this. Okay. Locke made sure to include many quotes from Herschel reporting discoveries made through close observation of the moon. Essentially, he's like, you know, when you see those videos of someone like reacting to another video, like on Instagram or like TikTok or any of that. Yeah. This is basically like the equivalent of that in the day where he's just like, oh, Locke said this and then now I'm writing about it. Or it's like a, a retweet or whatever when you quote tweet something. Wait, so we're the same. It's, it's all cyclical. So because... It was rooted in this idea of truth of like what had actually happened. And it was a person who had made these discoveries who was famous. It was an easy thing to just be like, OK, oh, well, yeah. I'm going to insert myself into this narrative. And then people were like, oh, OK, cool. Yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> additionally, I mean, this part I thought yeah. you'd, you'd really like. The article cited the Edinburgh Journal of Science, which had stopped publication years <laughs> earlier as the source of the story. <laughs> That's smart, though. You do things just on the edge of false. You know what I yep. mean? Where it's like yep. right there in the in the weird gray area where no one really knows if they're still going or you know, if that's still going or if this person even was around. I love. Oh, this is amazing. And so again, so it's like okay, well, Herschel's a real guy, and the Edinburgh Journal is sorry, the Edinburgh Journal of Science was a real paper, right? And so why would you not think that Doctor Grant was like a real guy? And on top of all of this, he wrote it in a style similar to the voice of John Herschel oh, uh, in terms of wow. his writing, which, let me tell you, uh, is just absolutely insufferable. It reads. <laughs> <laughs> it's so oh. awful. I hate it. I was so angry reading it. And it reads like a college freshman trying to write a 500 oh. word essay with like two sentences worth of ideas. It just, just rage. Oof. Just reading this was just rage. I was like, just say a sentence. I don't know what I'm reading. This doesn't make any sense. 
this looks like fluff or like like filler it it just feels like filler and it's very it feels it's very old timey and uh-huh. it's like it's just make an idea as complicated as possible uh, with with no substance to it i mean but, the more fancy words you use the more people are going to be like this guy's real but that's what i'm saying so exactly so people were like oh we used a bunch of you know two dollar words this guy <laughs> is like a genius clearly he's got a thesaurus so this is all stuff that adds to why it ends up um, becoming so uh, popular and widely accepted. They're like, okay, like I said, famous guy that's real, famous newspaper that actually exists, bunch of strong, <laughs> bunch of complicated words, but a big, but a boom. Smart man, smart guy words, yeah. Smart guy words, being genius, smart stuff. And so uh, let's see. Synergy. <laughs> Synergy. So the first part was published on Tuesday, August twenty fifth. 1835, and in a stroke of luck, Halley's Comet was first spotted by U.S. astronomers on that very day. Oh, he didn't plan that. No. That is the kind of marketing you simply wow. cannot buy. You can't. Yeah. That's like, that's that's pure. That, that, that right there just solidified this entire story. It was destined to be a huge deal. And so the story itself was broken up into sections day by day by day. So I'm going to go through the different days. Okay. Okay, you ready? Yeah. So day one was dedicated to the journey and the and the uh, construction of Herschel's telescope. Again, it's just awful writing and it's a miracle <laughs> that anyone just read this dog shit and was like, oh, I want to read more. I just cannot believe that somebody was like, I'll come back. The two sentences in, uh, I wanted to die. Um, essentially, I mean, I mean, I can read like a section of Lisa, it if you wanted. I want, I want you to. Okay, let me go <laughs> I need to, to the hear first. You read this. <laughs> the first day, I'll read part of it so you can also be angry like me. Okay, let's see. I'll, I'll just start in the beginning. In this unusual addition to our journal, we have the happiness of making known to the British public and thence to the whole civilized world recent discoveries in astronomy which will build an imperishable monument to the age in which we live and confer upon the present generation of the human race a proud distinction through all future time. It has been poetically said that the stars of heaven are the hereditary regalia of man as the intellectual <laughs> sovereign of the animal creation. He may Tell now me. fold the zodiac around him with a loftier conscientiousness of his mental supremacy. It is possible to contemplate any great astronomical discovery without feelings closely allied to a sensation of awe and nearly akin to those with which a departed spirit may be supposed to discover the realities of a future state. Bound by the irrevocable laws of, da- laws of nature to the globe on which we live, creatures close shut up in infinite expanse, it seems like acquiring a fearful supernatural power with any remote mysterious oh, works gosh, of the creator oh, yield oh, tribute to our it. curiosity. Do it. I can't. That was horrible. <laughs> It just goes on and on. <laughs> that was nothing. Yeah, exactly. That That's what I'm saying. It's, there was not a sentence in there. That was, it was just <laughs> word. It was just word salad. No, that, that was like a torture. Yeah, and it goes on for six days. <laughs> <laughs> Did you read through all of these? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no wonder you were like, I've gone too far. In that text you sent me. You sent me a text. You're like, this is too much. I can't stop. I can't deal with this. Well, because there's like summaries that people put. And I'm like, yeah, but you got to read the source if you can. And I was like, so yeah. I was reading the source. And I'm like, oh, I hate everyone. Um, yep. So that, that was hard to hear. Yeah. It's just. Tell me what that means. So what that means essentially in the summary of the first page was <laughs> uh, Herschel's dad, like I said, was a famous astronomer. Uh, obviously, he discovered Uranus, your anus, <laughs> and he had been working on. <laughs> that's who that was. That's who it was. It was the guy that discovered your anus. Oh, uh, it's a real guy. And that's he had nice been working. <laughs> he had been working on some new telescope <laughs> designs and whatnot, but he died. And since Uh-oh. old Johnny was a nepo baby and learned about telescopes, like in the crib, he was like, "Yo, Dad, don't worry, hold my beer." And he figured out an even more like telescopic telescope, and it was big and fancy. The end. Whatever. Don't read this. This is terrible. Their anus. Yeah, that was a stupid joke. <laughs> and that's more or less. It's basically like, oh, uh, the moon. We discovered some stuff. It's going to be really important. And then here's the dude. Here's the here's the structure of what this telescope is and here's how it works and people were like wow we use a lot of big words it must be real and smart and i hate this man and everyone who read it so day two (laughs) (laughs) just a sweeping judgment (laughs) of every single 
I cannot warn you enough to not read this. Uh, unless you're trying to get angry about something, in which case, just oh, read this. Oh, I don't this. need yeah. anything to yeah. make me get angry. Maybe maybe if you're a I'm boxer, already... I would read this before I had a match. So I could just take it all out on like Jake Paul or whoever, whoever I have to fight. One of the Paul brothers. <laughs> yeah. So on day two, he's like, okay, they packed up all that shit from England and they sailed to Cape Town. And then he explains how a telescope is supposed to actually be like set up or whatever. But like since Herschel's design was like so awesome and top secret, he was like, oh, I can't get into it. But straight up, me and my fourth form charms thought it was like quite corking. It was it was delightful. <laughs> <laughs> so he pretty much said, I can't tell you what happened, but you, I promise it did happen. Yeah. Scout's honor. Definitely a real thing. <laughs> I'm just trying to protect copyright here because if I give it away... Then everyone's going to have a cool telescope and they'll be able to see this. And I can't do that to my homeboy Herschel. Got to be it, protective of it. It's funny because like at the time, these like little pamphlets and newspapers were literally everywhere. Like everyone yeah. who had access to a printing press was like, I'm going to start a newsletter and yeah. I'll hand it out everywhere. And yeah. so I feel like I wonder if people were just like, oh, another new religion. Oh, another little thing. And then they see this and they're like, there's people on the moon. Yeah. If it were me, I'd be like, this is stick. This is actually standing out among all the other stuff I've seen because someone's claiming there's people on the moon. Anyway, I'm just yeah. picturing what that would be like to just see so much stuff from so many yeah. people. It's like podcasting. They're just like, like another podcast, podcast with two people talking. Another? One of them bearded? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> another podcast about the 1904 Olympic marathon. Great. I there are so many. <laughs> ours have that ours is... have moon people in this one, so yeah. it, maybe it will be the modern day equivalent of being interesting. <laughs> so you're right. That's a good. That's a good parallel. Again, that's also why I keep thinking this this story is interesting. There's so many parallels to like what's happening yeah. now, specifically with the internet age. I think and like um, a glut of information, most of mm -hmm, it false, and mm -hmm, what people mm -hmm. do with that. Yeah. Oof. Oof. Okay. And so he sort of gets into the explanation of like, oh, we got to build it. And it was this expensive and blah, blah, blah. We're in South Africa. It's fun, yada, yada. And eventually they finally piece together the um, the telescope. And then they look inside. And so at first, what they describe is seeing a, a basaltic rock formations covered with red flowers that looked like poppies. Oh. Um, so imagine, if you will, did you ever see Rear Window, the Hitchcock no. movie? He's like, it's the one with Jimmy Stewart where he breaks his leg and he's just like sitting looking oh, through a telescope because he's I've bored. Only seen, and he's oh, looking the all one the where he like, oh, the Simpsons parody did that. The Simpsons yeah, I've seen parody, the Simpsons yeah. one. I've yes. only seen Simpsons parodies of everything. Uh, that's basically what this is. So it's just, really? I mean, no one's got a broken leg, but they're just like, oh, cool. And then I saw this through the telescope and then this and this and this. So it's just a bunch of reports about that. So first he sees a bunch of rocks and he sees poppies, doesn't see anything else. Then he's just like, and then we keep. Rocks and poppies, they're switching lenses in and out. Then he sees like weird trees and like a forest. So he's like, all right, cool. The moon is inhabitable like Earth because there's trees on there and poppies and there's, you know, plant life. I have a question. Go ahead. Is, is this like, do you know at the time what people's understanding of the moon was? Was it kind of like one of those like weird mysteries or did people kind of know already that it was just a big rock? Um, dead dead that, rock in I, space. That's a good question. I don't know exactly at this time. I think okay. if nothing else, the general public didn't really know. Right. Okay. I'd say that like I would if I had to guess, I think maybe some scientists knew. I don't know. But yeah. I, I, the premise of this whole story is that like most people, okay. you know, Joe on the street didn't realize that that was the case. Right. Uh, he sees trees, forest. Then he sees some wa water and deep blue oceans. <laughs> oh, okay. And, yeah, water, deep blue ocean. And I'm like, are you sure you don't have this thing like turned around and you're just like looking into <laughs> continental Africa? But <laughs> Oh, there's some land for us to take. Yeah. Ooh, oh, we've already taken it. Dang it. <laughs> oh. And then he sees eventually his first uh, living creature, oh. which is a herd of what he essentially describes as like moon bison. <laughs> <laughs> They're like uh, bison, but on the moon. Oh, wait. What I, I wanted, I wonder what that was to look like. What would a moon bison look like? Um, I could actually pull the. I figured you would basically oh. go catatonic on the description of the moon bison. No, um, but if you want, I can <laughs> pull it up. I like how you're always assuming I'm one step away from being completely catatonic. 
Um, no, no, I just mean like based on how I read it earlier. Uh, basically, that's like a projection of like I went catatonic reading these things. Oh, so I was okay. like, I don't want to read the description, but I should put you to sleep doing it. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I'll do I'll do my best to. You can stop me at any point with this, so it doesn't get too because I also don't want people listening to you know also want to die. Um, <laughs> don't. Let's see. Here's the thing okay. we're gonna do. Okay. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna our podcast is gonna go until the year 2061. <laughs> And when we'll still do it too, even if we're both senile. In the bog. Yeah. And when when that comet comes around, us and all of our listeners are going to hop right on it. Oh my God! You're Just, starting a cult finally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Plan okay. On it. So the description is goes as such. So it says small collections of trees of every imaginable kind were scattered about the whole of the luxuriant area and our magnifiers blessing blah, 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 blah. in the shade of the woods on the southeastern side we beheld continuous herds of brown quadrupeds having all the external characteristics of the bison but more diminutive uh, than any species of the boss genus in our natural history its tail is like that of our boss grunions but in its semular <laughs> semicircular horns the hump on its shoulders and the depths of its dewlap and the length of its shaggy <laughs> hair, it closely resembles the species to which I first compared it. Awful. Dewlap? Uh, I don't know had, what a dewlap is, but it's I don't know so what any of this pretty means. much a mini bison, a tiny yeah. little moon bison. That's kind of cute. It, ha it had, however, one widely distinctive feature, which we afterwards found common to nearly every lunar quadru quadruped we have discovered, namely oh, no. a remarkable fleshy appendage over the eyes, crossing <laughs> the whole breadth of the forehead and united to the Ooh, ears. What? So pretty much like a flesh eyebrow. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what I'm hearing? Basically, yeah. We most distinctly perceive this hairy veil, which was shaped like the upper front oh. outline of a cap known to the ladies as Mary Queen of Scott's cap, lifted and lowered by means of the ears. It immediately occurred is... to the cute mind of Dr. Herschel that this was a provident, providential contrivance to protect the eyes of the animal from the extremes of light and darkness of which all inhabitants of our side of the moon are periodically subjected. Please kill me. Um, yeah, that's uh, so ugh. skin flap to protect them against Earth's light. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's Gross. got like a, it's Sick. awful. It was <laughs> like bangs made of skin. Bang. <laughs> I gotta, I there you go. Draw that. Skin Half bangs. a sentence. Bangs there made of skin. We could have just said that. <laughs> I got some right here. <laughs> and then he saw a surprise fun new creature. It was of a bluish lead color about the size of a goat with a head and beard like him and a single horn slightly inclined forward from the perpendicular. The female was destitute of horn and beard, but had a much longer tail. It was gregarious, chiefly abounded on the grounded about whatever. I don't care. Basically, he saw unicorns. <laughs> he saw unicorns. He saw moonicorns. unicorns. Moonicorns. <laughs> moonicorns. Except uh, and they a also little flesh. Little yeah, flesh with, a, with a fleshy I, I flesh. I I cannot stop being fixated on the flesh eyebrow. It's, it's, I can't. It's going to be like this. Like, <laughs> how did you do that? I have fleshy eyebrows. I'm from the moon. Oh my, look at you. Oh, there. Oh, there we go. Ow, that hurt. <laughs> Ellie. Okay. Ellie, Ellie. Okay. And then he saw some moon cranes and pelicans. That's it. That's day two. So, <laughs> That's so stupid. I hate it so much. <laughs> so dumb. I love this story. Okay. <laughs> Day three. Blah, blah, blah. More landscape crap. He sees a volcano and craters and shit. But then they see the first signs of intelligent life. Oh. Can you guess okay. what they are? Uh, Houses. No. Who lives? In, yeah. And I'm saying who lives in these houses? Oh, people. Humans. Moon men. Okay. <laughs> they are. Tell me. Just tell me. Bipedal beavers. They are beavers <laughs> that walk upright. <laughs> I never in a billion years would I have guessed that. So they have the... <laughs> <laughs> There's beaver okay. people living on the moon, walking upright. And he takes <laughs> essentially the old school model of National Ge Geographic, like tribal people in the Amazon, but it just swaps them yeah. out with beavers. Oh, no. And he's, and he's like, it carries its young in its arms like a human being and moves with an easy gliding oh. motion. Its huts are constructed better and higher than those of many tribes of human savages. And from the appearance Yikes. of smoke in nearly all of them, there is no doubt of its being acquainted with the use of fire. Yikes. 
<laughs> yeah. That is <laughs> problematic. That's bad. <laughs> oh, I want to meet a beaver person from the moon. So don't forget at this time, and I'll get more into this. Okay, sorry. Let me let me keep going. So yeah, he's got the beaver people, and they were cool, and everybody's excited. But it's it's a teaser for the main event, which comes on day four. Okay. Which <laughs> the next entry would provide us with an even stranger creature. Yeah. The main event was the Vesperatilio Homo, or more simply put, bat people on the moon. <gasps> yeah. Dude, I wish this were real. I want to see a bat person. So Batman. Batman? Bat people on the moon. Batman on the moon. <laughs> okay. And because because Locke made something that was so popular because it was serialized, I'm going to end this episode here and go to a part no, two. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. <laughs> hey, you told me this was going to be a two-parter, but I forgot. Yep, and so yep. I'm, you turd. Yep. I'm sorry. It's I'm okay. sorry. I had to do it. Bat people. Uh, bat people. Oh, and it gets, oh, it gets weird. Oh, it gets, no. it gets great in every way that you would want it to. I can't believe you. That will, I, I, I will, I will go in depth into the rest of it <laughs> and what the story is and <clears throat> some of the imagery and where it's pulled from. So. Uh, I know that you're going to be tempted to go read everything based on the excerpts that I've given you, but uh, I'm pretty sure that you're going to hold off for the next week. I will. I will. I also have like other things to do. So yeah, just lies. <laughs> Neither just do kidding. I. Um, wow. Oh, I'm excited. Yeah. You're yeah. And again. I say this every time, but you're really good at cliffhangers. Pisses me Thank off. You. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Because if it were me, I'd be like, okay, that's it. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs> I have no like build up. <laughs> Build up. Okay. Um, so now it comes to the part of our episode where we're going to close our tabs. Let's uh, do it. What do you think would be a good sound effect? Um, I think it's going to have to be pulled from yours. It's you Is it so? like, you know what I think uh, of actually right now based on what you're talking vomiting? about? What? No. Do you remember in Dumb and Dumber where uh, they're giving the guy that's trying to kill them in the hot, the hot chicken place or whatever, the hot sandwich place? And then he's like, I've got pills because I got gas. And then they give him rat poison by accident because he was trying to give them Shirley. He was trying to poison their Shirley temples. Vaguely. And then he makes the gargly sound. He's like. <laughs> and it like gargles from his mouth. It's a very yes. specific sound. Okay. We do that. We're going to make the, the dumb and dumber gargling sound. The dumb and dumber gargling death sound is what I think we should do when we close the tab. Yeah. <laughs> okay. From, Where it from sounds rat like, poison. <laughs> it sounds like vinegar and like baking soda mixing and coming out. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that that is specific reference works so well for this. <laughs> okay. Okay, you count us down. All right, you ready? Yep. Three, two, one. Uh. Wow. All right, moving on. Listener emails, you're up first. Yeah, emails, I am up first. Okay, this is from Hector from Chile. So we got a Chile. Yeah. Um, And Hector says, Dear 500 Open Tabs, greetings from Chile. I'm a big fan of this podcast. I used to be a recovering tab addict with just a couple ones opened. And since I started listening to your podcast, I remembered my love for opening tabs to read random things. And now I'm over 200 in just a couple weeks. We are enablers. (laughs) <laughs> Thanks for feeding the monster you are trying to destroy. <laughs> Sorry, you know what, Hector? Hector? Don't deny yourself what you love. Yeah, it's not hurting anybody. It's just taps. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's doing it. Uh, my tab for you is one of the few ones I kept kept open for some time now, and comes with a short story. I am originally from Venezuela, and at Easter in one of the towns, there's a little tradition called Diablos Danzantes de Yare which means dancing devils of Yare that right. involve religion and people dancing with huge devil masks. Pretty normal stuff. Hell yeah. <laughs> anyway, I grew up knowing about this and it was like a cultural thing. And then one day, many years later, I'm in this bar in Chile and I see a huge devil mask shaped cup, just like the ones they used. And I pointed to a friend, hey, that's a mask they use in Easter in my country. And he says, what are you talking about? That's from here. I looked that up online and boy, oh boy, turns out there's a whole lot of dancing devil rituals all across Latin America, each with his own ritual and tradition. I opened many tabs about it and I finally 
sat and read them all thanks to you. It was great. Yes. You can see. Yeah, these devil masks are dope looking. You can see this paper from an exposition at Ohio State University called Dancing with the Devils that tells you a brief story showing many of the masks and the traditions related across all countries. And there's some good links. Um, Whoa, these more, are awesome. I know, right? If you're more interested, uh, like antlers you can on always them and stuff. look for the specific celebrations in Wikipedia. There's tons more oh, info. Oh, man. I wish you the best with this project. It's really great. Hector. Whoa. Hector. Oh, these Thank are you. so cool. These I want to find beautiful. the Guatemalan one. Is there a Guatemalan oh, man. one? Whoa, this is awesome. Whoa. There's so many cool masks in here. Yeah. Yeah. I like how it's Easter. <laughs> they do it on Easter. That is awesome. Uh, Hector, wonderful, wonderful contribution. Uh, he's from yeah, Chile. Thank you. Which yeah. is very cool. We like Chile. Uh, as they say in Chile, vive, <laughs> vive Chile mierda is what they kept telling me to say when I was there. <laughs> you, what does that mean? I speak Spanish, actually. I know what that means. Chile is, I mean, it's a swear word, but I guess that's what yeah, the locals that's say when we're talking about Chile being awesome. <laughs> Oh, you've been to Chile? I've been to Chile, yeah. I went in 2006, I think. Oh, cool. I, I did a Chile and Peru trip, which oh, was also beautiful. controversial because the Chileans and the Peruvians apparently oh. had a rivalry that I learned about when they were there. But I like both places very much. Dude, nobody nobody likes each other anywhere. <laughs> anywhere, <laughs> like... it's true. Anyway, uh, Hector, uh, wherever you are, I hope you're having a great time looking at cool, awesome devil masks and yeah. uh, keep those tabs going, buddy. Uh, <laughs> all right. Email number two. We also have an international one. It's Shalene Ooh. from New Zealand, which I believe oh. the pronunciation is Shalene because it looks like Charlene without an R. So I apologize yeah. if it's not pronounced as Shalene, but that's my best approximation. So Shalene writes, okay. Kia ora, Hannah and Kave. Greetings cool. from New Zealand. <laughs> cool. This is less of an internet tab and more of a tab I can't close in my brain. I thought you would like this one, Hannah, which is why I wanted to read this one. Okay. Uh, It's a tab I can't close in my brain. I most often have the joy of listening to you while I close up at the board game cafe I work at. Oh. Hannah (laughs) Hannah said tab hole. Well, by the way, do you remember when we were in that (laughs) board game cafe in Seattle? (laughs) And we had to fake playing a game so they wouldn't kick us out. And I was like, who are we going to get a fight with if they look at us weird again? There was some drunk guy who kept going over and talking to us, making passive yeah. aggressive comments. And I was like, excuse was me? Like, You're not playing a game. This is a board yeah. game cafe. And we're like, and I'm like, what are you, up. mom? Shut up. Yeah. So we went and grabbed uh, a board game and like kind of moved the pretended. pieces. And, yeah. Yeah. We're really like, oh my God, we're playing. I'm like, we just did a convention. We're just trying to catch up and there's only chairs here. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Hannah said tab hole while I was rinsing dishes and I heard tad pole, (laughs) which spurred images of your tabs as baby frogs swimming around. Cute. Oh. Uh, The more you explain your tab, the bigger it grows until you finish the episode with two fully formed tab frogs. We raise them. By the way, that squeak, amazing. I don't think I've heard you squeak like that before. Like a tad pole. I got really into the idea of tiny little frogs. As you talk, the frogs take on characteristics from the stories you're telling. So I have quite a cast of characters hopping around up there. Oh, (laughs) my goodness. Okay. Sometimes your stories blend together to make one big frog. Like last (laughs) week, you had a frog that looked suspiciously (laughs) like a tortoise with a Hitler mustache in a large (laughs) trench coat with lots of pockets for stealing things from Air Force One. (laughs) Shailene, I love you. This is beautiful. One of us. What? Very much one of us. Oh, uh, totally. It's fun to see your tabs growing from tadpoles to beautiful, weird frogs. Now, every <laughs> time I do the dishes, whether I'm listening to your lovely pod- podcast or not, I think of tadpoles. Thanks for keeping me company while I straighten board game shelves and put up chairs. Love the podcast. Keep it Josie. Shaleen. Oh, thank you, Shaleen. I, what would the frog for this episode be? I mean, oh, I, for sure Lord. the frog would have one of those, those oh, the skin meat eyebrows. Flap. Yeah, yeah, the, the meat, meat flap eyebrow. Meat flap. <laughs> meat flap. <laughs> It's, <laughs> It'd be wearing like old timey running shorts. It's ingesting, ra- yeah. It's got the cut off shorts, like the yes. never nude wool shorts. Yeah, ingesting rat poison the entire yeah. time, and drinking and brandy. brandy. It's actually growing in a, like instead of like a pond, it's just a bunch of brandy that brandy. it's swimming around yeah. in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's and it's looking through a telescope. I don't know. 
Yeah, it's looking through a telescope. With and... the skin flap. <laughs> yes. Oh, I love this. I, I, I want to go like all one. the episodes and, and figure out what the frog looks like. The frog. Um, that would be a fun little... <gasps> Imagine the werewolf episode. Mm. Just like a, a frog Peter Stump. with a belt. With a belt, yeah. Peter Stump frog. Yeah, the frog wearing a belt that turns into a frog tadpole. I don't know. Uh, um, I'm sorry, tadpole werewolf. This is getting crazy. That's Tad probably wolf. our sign to end this. Tadpole. Probably. Uh, Thank you for your emails. If you guys have an email that you'd like to submit and have us read on the show, please go ahead and email us at 500opentabs at gmail.com. That's 500 open tabs. Let us know your blurb about what you learned, the link to the article, of course, and tell us where you're from because now we've got a friend in Chile and a friend in New Zealand, which is exciting. And uh, we'd like to know where you guys are. Yeah. And uh, if you want to support us uh, on Patreon, we'd Right now we have a Patreon. It's purely donation only, but we are working on a lot of fun things for it. So please help us pay our editor. Please help us. Please. Give us money. It turns out this is a lot of work. <laughs> I thought it would just be a fun thing. Uh, it's fun work, it, but oh, it is it's so quite fun, a lot of but work. And we're like, yes. oh, okay. But yeah, we can cut that part out. But yeah, if you want to uh, support us financially, that'd be awesome. Um, looking forward to some fun Patreon things. Uh, or follow us on YouTube, right? YouTube, this is a video podcast. If you didn't know yep. that by now, um, go check it out. You can see our terrified expressions of joy or sadness or anger yeah. or, or mostly disgust. anger. Disgust and anger, I think, is mostly yeah. what we do. Uh, we got a Discord. Discord's <laughs> yeah. popping off. It keeps going. People keep talking about stuff. They're forcing us to start <laughs> musical po- tabs <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that they have to talk about musical stuff. And they really like it. And they're excited. And I'm just happy yeah. that they're there. We had to make uh, a different chat room for musicals and linguistics and linguistics uh, yeah that's another one yeah. and then there's fry sauce freaks which i still don't really yeah, understand utah. what the hell that oh, was well, all about oh, i'll tell you right now it's fry sauce is utah's specialty uh dipping sauce okay if you want to learn about it. dipping sauces and no, musicals and linguistics utah or idaho <laughs> or the fry sauce belt is what i'm going to call it the fry sauce belt you can learn more about it uh we also have 500 open roads which is our google map thing that uh places all the events that we've talked about um, okay. on a map which encourages you to hopefully do a road trip to go see it and listen to the, epi- yeah. the corresponding episode on it um of course uh follow us on socials i'm at perma friends on instagram you are at hannah hillam on everything and um, we'll be at san diego comic-con at the end yes. of last week last week of july so i think it's the 25th starting the 25th i think it's the 23rd is preview night we should have probably no, pulled I think it's the 24th 24th, that's definitely what I said the whole time I was right. Yes, you're right. 24th is when it begins. Yeah. Uh, we'll be there that whole week. We'll be in Artist Alley. Uh-huh. We will see booth, if we have other stuff to announce. Booth BB01 and, and two. 02. Yeah, yeah, we're neighboring. We're right on the end. Uh, yeah. Over by the... Uh, Tower of T-shirts. Tower of T-shirts, assuming it's there again. <laughs> At I don't know. the Funko Pop area, anyway. Yeah, the Funko Pop. Anyway, come see us. Uh, is there anything oh, else? Oh, uh, yeah. Pre-order my book, Cat People by Hannah Hillam. The book. Yes. Pre-order yep. that book. And I guess that about does it. Uh, we'll see you guys next week. I'll have the yep. second part of <laughs> The Great Moon Hoax. Hannah will have another thing. It's going to be really fun. Yeah. See you next so, week. And keep it Josie. Keep it Josie. Oh, wow. We actually had an ending. <laughs> yeah. Weird. Bye. Bye.